So I wanted to preface this because I know that this could be an issue online, especially in the English speaking world. Okay. That being said, the main subject that I will be talking about over the next hour to hour and a half, okay, will not be anti-Semitism. In fact, it is going to be a very, very nuanced but direct criticism of the state of Israel, okay? And for those of you who don't know, although... The history of anti-Semitism and the history of the state of Israel are indeed intertwined. After all, the state of Israel was formed in response to what happened during the Holocaust. The state of Israel does not represent all Jewish people. And in fact, the idea that it does is an, is an incredibly offensive and right-wing, hyper-extremist Zionist position. Okay? Now, I want to make something very clear as well. Another another thing that I want to make very clear in this discussion, okay? And that is that while there is a lot to be talked about in this discussion, while there is all kinds of history and complicated things and horrible things that have happened all across the way, what is happening in Israel right now there isn't really a whole lot of nuance to, okay? It's not a particularly complex issue at this point. What we have right now is an ethnic cleansing being carried out by the right-wing controlled state of Israel, by Benjamin Netanyahu, and his and and people members of his party people who were associated with him people who were who found themselves very very much tied to the very uh fascist elements of our own country okay you don't like that it's being called ethnic cleansing instead of genocide well there's a lot, couple of reasons for that. We can call it genocide. We can call it ethnic cleansing. I will probably use these terms interchangeably, okay? Okay? I, 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 I don't think that that's a particularly, um, you know, they're, that those are similar terms, okay? Pardon me um, if I don't use the exact correct terms all of the time through here, okay? And for the record, as a, uh, as a, um, as a, as a precursor to this conversation, I'm not an expert on Israeli history, okay? I'm not an expert on Palestinian history, okay? But what we've seen over the last couple of days in Gaza is nothing short of horrifying, sickening, and deeply, deeply saddening. There have been reports of white phosphorus used. There was a very, very shocking bombing of a massive residential building that was caught on video yesterday. You can watch a towering apartment complex get blown to shit by an Israeli missile. There are videos of children writhing in pain, okay? And the response from the Israeli state has been, quite frankly, embarrassing. Don't believe me? Let me show you. Let me show you real quick. Fourteen Palestinian children dead? Yup. Here is the official account of the state of Israel. It's been a difficult night for us, exhausted after spending hours in bomb shelters, but waking up to so many messages of support from you guys helps. Thank you, Heart. This is the official state Twitter account of Israel. Fucking oo-woo posting. Like they had a rough night at the bar. And quite frankly, 
that is disgusting to me. Okay? That is a level of of bald-faced manipulate manipulative intent of of Machiavellian cold-hearted propaganda that really just boils my fucking blood. Okay? Yeah, it's ridiculous. They're laughing in the face. They're laughing in the face. Zero mention of deaths, no mentions of the of the violence of, of innocent people dying. And in fact, the the worst part is this isn't even the worst of it because this might be the most on its face infuriating. Seeing a tweet like this might make might remind you, might remind you very much of the behaviors of other far right, disgusting, violent, performatively cruel regimes of the past. You have your pick. Whether it's the American conservatives laughing at children in cages on the border or whatever else, you have your pick. You can draw whatever parallels you want. But there is something just, it feels like you're being spit in the face, right? It feels like someone's spitting in your face. Yeah, exactly. But what's actually worse is that right now, all across the state of Israel, every single right-wing newspaper is churning out misinformation and, and deliberate disinformation. Okay? Everything from, from fake videos of, uh, of, of missiles being, of, of like, of like, "Quote unquote Hamas missile launchers being moved around in Palestine to uh, to scaremongering videos of unidentified Palestinian violence, framing Palestinians as as un uncontrollable barbarians who must be cracked down upon, to lying about events that are happening, like when a is a an Israeli driver ran over two Palestinian p protesters." And the as many right wing Israeli newspapers left off the fact that he that this person ran over two people before a crowd accosted them. And guess what? The Israeli security forces did nothing. They fought off the crowd and they did nothing to stop the person who had just run over two people. Okay? Now, for those of you who don't know, we talked about white phosphorus on stream once before when we were doing a segment on American military war crimes. And unfortunately, um, the, uh, the IDF, is Israel's security forces, have used white phosphorus multiple times. And there have been reports of it being used again. It's very hard to tell exactly what's going on, although I'm sure the final truth will come out relatively soon okay however okay it has been used in the past and we have reason to believe that it would be um uh that it will be that it has been used again and i want to read something to you real quick okay and a little bit of a trigger warning here i'm going to read you what white phosphorus does to the human body Okay? And I'm not going to show any pictures because that will make you sick. Okay? White phosphorus burns at a temperature of up to 2,760 degrees Celsius. Incandescent particles from weapons using powdered white phosphorus as their payload produce extensive partial and full thickness burns, as will any attempt to handle burning submunitions without protective equipment. Phosphorus burns carry an increased risk of du mortality due to the absorption of phosphorus into the body throughout the burned area with prolonged contact, which can result in liver, kidney, and heart damage, and in many cases, multiple organ failure. White phosphorus particles continue to burn until completely consumed unless entirely deprived of oxygen. In the case of weapons using felt impregnated submunitions, incomplete combustion may occur, resulting in up to 50% 
of the white phosphorus content remaining unburned. Such submunitions can prove hazardous as they are capable of spontaneous reignition if crushed um, by, hum by people's footsteps or by vehicles. In some cases, injuries is limited to areas of exposed skin because smaller white phosphorus pot particles do not burn completely through clothing before being consumed. These are the types of things. This is the type of, 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 of uh, munition that results in people's skin melting off of them. Okay? Do you understand? Did someone do war crimes again? Yeah, it looks like they have. Now, there are countless videos that you can go, you just, all you need to do is go look at the current news sources. We have videos of, of Israeli soldiers pointing their guns at children. And keep in mind that the context of this is an ongoing, often state-backed colonization of Palestinian land, a.k.a. You're sitting in your house one day, playing, maybe you're playing some video games, maybe you're playing Fortnite with your buddies, yeah? And, <coughs> excuse me, and all of a sudden, you hear a knock on your door. Yeah? Open up. And five minutes later, you and your entire family have been forcibly evicted from your house without your belongings, Maybe somebody got mad. Maybe your dad got mad. Maybe your brother got mad and now is in cuffs on the floor. And you don't have a house anymore. You go from having a house to having nothing or being dead in a matter of minutes. Yeah, knocking makes me anxious too. But imagine somebody knocking on your door with a gun. That's a little bit, that's a little bit horrifying, okay? And keep in mind that all of this follows only a couple days after um, Israeli security forces um, attacked a, 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 a place of worship, okay? And I want you to understand how this went. So, an Arabic holy day that many people are going to be celebrating is going to occur. An Israeli right-wing group a far-right group that does not like Arabic people decides to get together to protest their free religious practice. And when they go to show up, it is the Israeli security forces that step in and end up cracking down on the religious worshipers. Not on the people, not on the right-wing group, that was, go that was protesting the free expression of religion. But instead on the group that was practicing their religion peacefully. And that mosque ended up getting bombarded with tear gas, rubber bullets, batons. There were beatings. People died. And the result is that Israel is in a position right now where they are saying, we will not back down. We are going to fight back against the violence that they initiated. Okay? And that's a really bad thing. So this is why I say that it's not really an issue of particular nuance when we're talking about what is happening right now. Now, is there some conflict back and forth? Yes, there is. Okay? Yes, there absolutely is. But that does not justify a highly militarized, highly American-backed, um highly american backed um group unleashing the full power of its military um on essentially an imprisoned and surrounded group of mostly civilian people and i want you to know that right now in fact this just broke i'm just going to show you something real quick okay take a look at this
UN envoy warns of a full-scale war as death toll rises in Israel-Hamas violence. But I want you to know, since Monday, at least 53 Palestinians, including 14 children, have been killed. At least six Israelis were also killed. Okay? And a lot of news sources are framing this as a Hamas-Israel war. But it's not members of Hamas that are getting killed. It's children. Fuck you, MetaMask says, every day I ask Jesus for help, but it's not happening. My father and my sister are still there. I don't know what they are going through. I can't see them. I don't know what they're doing. Do you understand me? Yes, I understand you completely, okay? I have never had to experience that, but I understand the fear of not being connected to your family, of being distant and not being able to do anything. And I'm very, very sorry that that's something you're dealing with. I'm really sorry. War is unimaginably, unimaginably bad. You all here, unless you've seen war, cannot imagine how bad it is. And I say that as somebody who has not firsthand seen war, but who has seen a lot of violence in my life, okay? It's hard to call this a war. Well... When I say war, I don't mean like an equivalent fight, okay? I fear we're going to be dragged into war against our wills. Well, yeah. Yeah, because guess what? Here in America, the right wing backed the current right wing Israeli government whole hog. And so far, our politician statements have been horrible. In Gaza right now, there are Palestinians who have no internet, who have no power, who have no running water. And I mean a lot. I mean, Israelis are blowing up power plants. There's no, there are people who are not going to be getting power back. Can you imagine what your life would be like? I want you to just take a minute right now and close your eyes. And I want you to imagine what your life would be like if tomorrow all your power went out, your internet went out. And you found out through the grapevine of talking to your neighbors that it's because the power plant in your city is blown up and it won't be back, potentially ever. You might never get it back. I would like you to imagine what it's like for just a second for you to go down to the grocery store to pick up a couple of sodi pops for your partners or your, or your family, or your brother, and to come back to a, a pile of rubble. Can you even imagine what that would be like? I don't think most of us can. I don't think most of us know what it's like for it to be a real, like a reality that you could walk outside and have your family members disappear in the time that you walk down to the store and come back. And yes, that is a good point, Atona no Aji. I want to put this out there before we go whole hog into being anti-IDF. Service is mandatory. So a lot of these people in the IDF aren't even necessarily in favor of the actions they're committing. That is true. Interesting how that works, right? Isn't it a little bit interesting um, how that works? That fa far-right governments make military participation mandatory because they know that if there is a legal threat That, uh, to to military service that more people will have to go in and will have to commit the atrocities that they order them to do. And I want you to remember that there is a technological difference. Um, Israel has incredibly advanced anti-missile technology. They are taking very little damage, uh, very little harm 
from um from the uh whatever uh fire back there is from radical groups within Palestinian territory. Okay? And there are. Of course there are. Can you really blame people? I want you to put yourself in your in the foot of of somebody there. Can you really blame someone for deciding to pick up arms when if you walk out to the store to grab a couple of beers for your family and your house is leveled when you come back? Can you really blame somebody for saying I'm not doing this anymore? Huh? And I'm not saying that's the right answer. I think that um that violence perpetuates violence in many cases. But can you blame someone for coming to that conclusion? Let's take a look at this. Hamas confirms that several top commanders have been killed in Israeli strikes. Biden says Israel has a right to defend itself, to defend itself, to defend itself. That was Biden's statement. And you want to know what's worse? Andrew Yang's statement. Has anybody seen Andrew Yang's statement? Let's bring it up. Let's bring it up. Let's roast. Let's give a little bit of a roast to our old dumb, dumb friend, Andrew Yang. Now, before we get too far into this, I, I just want to say, I just want to say, Andrew Yang and the Yang gang, a lot of people were excited about Andrew Yang because he was talking a, about a UBI. However, something you'll forget that most people didn't know about Yang is that Yang was pushing a UBI that would undercut other social programs. So you would get less UBI if you, ha if you had disability. UBI. Did I say UTI? I said UBI, didn't I? So Yang has never been a hero of the people. Yang has always been basically a simp for corporate America. And now let's see what Yang has to say about all this. Because as always, Yang's um, statements are always a little bit, uh, a little bit stupid and and bad. Let me see if I can find the full quote. <clears throat> Here we go. I am standing with the people of Israel who are coming under bombardment attacks and condemn the Hamas terrorists. The people of New York City will always stand with our brothers and sisters in Israel who face down terrorism and persevere. Can you imagine a day after Israeli security forces attack the peaceful worshipers in a mosque, beating them with sticks, bombarding them with chemicals that make their eyes water, your lungs burn, your periods uh, it, it, it get it, it progressively worse and then you come out and say oh we denounce the the, the minis minuscule terrorism that comes from a group that's been radicalized by these actions what a stupid statement what an unbelievably stupid statement okay what an incredibly stupid statement but this is nothing new for uh andrew yang okay Oh, I agree. The people of New York City do not support that shit. He is out of touch. But that's nothing new. I mean, Andrew Yang has always been somewhat out of touch, yeah? And I want you to know that here in the United States, Jewish people do not, by and large, support this. Unfortunately, a lot of Israeli people do support this. And it's not... And once again, I ask you all to remember... Being that we are, we claim to be lefties. We claim to believe in 
structural and systemic analysis. We claim to believe in the analysis of the material conditions. I want you to remember that the people who live in Israel are inundated with right with the same if not more right-wing propaganda that our people here in America are. So even though it can be easy to say damn it the like like 55% of people I think it is like I can't remember the exact numbers but it's somewhere around the ballpark of about 50% of Israel supports these types of actions that a lot of these people are deeply, deeply indoctrinated. And we should try not to uh, blame the people for the actions of a government that is constantly propagandizing them. Okay? But, with that, even with that said, we can recognize that there is a systemic problem in Israel with the dehumanization of Palestinian people. Okay? And this is a, a systemic issue. It has to do with media that that is all all over the place supporting the actions of the state, the violent actions of the state. It has to do with political maneuvering that is defeating democratic structures in the name of consolidating right wing power in Israel. Okay. And also, I want to remind you that. In Israel, Palestinians are literally second-class citizens. They do not have the same rights as Israeli people just because of their ancestry, just because of where they were born. They are not given the same rights. Literally. Did you know that in order to go from one place to another, if you have to cross through uh, Israeli uh, land, that you will have to go through checkpoint after checkpoint after humiliating checkpoint. In fact, I found a thread, a really interesting thread that somebody wrote about their experience with these checkpoints and more. So I'm going to read this, okay? And this is, of course, a Palestinian's personal story. So keep in mind, oh, I don't think it's necessary to draw um, parallels to Nazi Germany. I think that we can denounce these things on their face, okay? You don't have to make uh, parallels to Nazi Germany, which are unnecessarily uh, fraught with all kinds of, of wrongful parallels in order to say that this is fucked. This is completely fucked, okay? So I understand the urge, but come on, let's, let's, let's try to keep things. I think that we can denounce an obvious situation of genocide, eth ethnic cleansing, and torture without having to draw any parallels that would make it easier for right-wing uh, right hyper-Zionists to uh, make their case, okay? But I want to read you this little thread that I found, because I found this very, very moving, okay? And sometimes, we all like facts and logic here. But sometimes when we're looking, when we're trying to accurately analyze a situation, we really need to have a little bit of a human perspective, okay? Only Facts TV says, you have an intellectual rigor and nuance that I admire and thank you for. There are not many of us leftists that can do that, so thank you. You're very welcome. I do my best. I'm not perfect, but I try my best, okay? And that comes from a long, long and very storied life life history okay so let's read this thread real quick and warning this gets pretty rough okay my grandfather was murdered in front of our entire family by the israeli forces and they made my mom carry his body down the stairs of our home while she was in her third trimester i was five years old and they put a gun to my head i think about it every single day of my life they refused to allow him medical attention and blocked off all ambulances from entering Everyone in the family was held at gunpoint, and my uncles and cousins were being tied to trees, but blindfolded. Everyone in our village stood at their front doors, watching in horror, ready to jump in to help clean up the mess these monsters created. Unfortunately, the mess was unfixable. We lost my grandfather way too soon. There is bullet holes that remain on the doors of our home in Palestine from that night. After the tragedy, I had to assimilate into America post 9-11. While the images of my dead grandfather played in my head and the rage that I had for these monsters continued to exist within me, while I was surrounded by the products of two Fox News-loving morons everywhere I went, 
I have stories from the border, the racists I encountered, and so much more. I did do therapy, and she told me to write a book. So, good morning. This popped off, so let me keep going. The border they force Palestinians to go through to get in and out of Palestine is a torture method. We should be able to fly in and out like anybody else. But because we hold Palestinian citizenship, they torture us instead. They leave us in hot, non-air-conditioned, overcrowded Greyhound buses, just rotting in the heat or the cold depending on the time of year. The Israeli forces steal from Palestinians, assault us, and I was even interrogated alone in a room with, gold me with grown men when I was just a five-year-old girl. I was sitting on the border bus with my family, then walks in a very young boy and his older brother. The, the little boy was covered in burns from head to toe. The bus had no AC and it was so hot he started to struggle to breathe, so we had to fan him down. The brother told us that he had requested a permit for his little brother to cross the border via ambulance and the Israelis denied him. I also think of that kid every day. The image of him appears continuously when I blink and therapy has not helped make that stop. And Till this day, with all of the brutal details of my experiences, I have assholes reply with, was your grandfather a terrorist or Hamas? Like, fuck off, man. I can continue to talk about this on my podcast, Banter Bees. It's available on Spotify. I worried about going into too much detail for our safety, but my family gave me the green light and said to share our story. You can also follow my Instagram at Banter Bees. I post more to my stories on there and we'll post the podcast episode, etc., etc. So this is somebody who's clearly opening up about their personal experiences. And I want to point out something. <sighs> There's a statement that you've probably heard tossed around on the left that goes something like this. The cruelty is the point. Okay? The cruelty is the point. Um, and when I talk about things like that, uh, when we talk about things like this, I should say, um, it's important that we remember things like that because these aren't accidents. It's not an accident that we have border facilities on the southern border of America where the rooms are kept so cold that people lose their minds and get sick from, from agony. It's not an accident that the lights are kept on almost all hours of the day. It's not an accident that Palestinians are left on buses in sweltering heat while they're trying to get into a place that they should be allowed to go to. These are the tactics of, a, of, of, of people who want to eliminate and ruin and instill terror. Okay? Do you understand that, right? I want you to think about it for just a second why these things would exist. Because if you're a right winger, if you believe that there is a supremacy over another type of person then you will do basically whatever you can to remind that person of their place in the world. We've seen this in nearly every atrocity, human rights atrocity throughout all of history. It's systematized abuse. Okay? It really, really is. And I will remind you that in many, many Historical human rights atrocities, examples of ethnic cleansing and genocide. Incidental death caused by neglect, disease, malnourishment, uh, exposure to the elements that is, you know, like hypothermia and heat stroke, are often incredibly high. Because, oops, nobody's fault there, right? You can wash your hands. If, you, if, you, if people just accidentally drop dead from the accidentally bad um, conditions, well, you, nobody can be blamed for that, right? Those people will just disappear. And the sad thing is, that often works. But see, we live in a special time in history. We live in a time in history where we are uniquely capable of accessing information. We are uniquely capable of looking things up and finding the truth on various matters and informing ourselves and making ourselves stronger so that we do not fall prey to the tactics that worked in the past. And the time has come on this goddamn planet that we stop pretending that it is an accident 
when thousands upon thousands of people are left to rot in the heat, when thousands upon thousands of children die from disease that, oh, oops, it's just the disease is spreading through our facilities. Oh, I, I guess we can spray them all constantly with, with chemicals that cause them burns and discomfort and diarrhea and everything else. It's a genocide. Okay? It's a fucking genocide. And once again, I'll state that the right wing in Israel is more than happy to uh, point to examples of global or foreign anti-Semitism, which absolutely exists. Um as a reason for why they should not be critiqued. And I would ask that all leftists, um, oh yeah, absolutely, I can give you that link. Here you go, it's right here. It's been going viral, so you can enjoy. There's the link to the thread if anybody wants the thread for themselves, okay? I would ask that all leftists learn how to critique the state of Israel without leaning on any anti-Semitic tropes, okay? Because if we learn how to do this, this is Shay from Banterbees. Wait, you're the word. Wait, you're one of the people. Wow. Hello, Shay. Shay, please come by to the website and we will give you a creator role. Um, if you come by to the website. There you go. Click on through to the website and I, we will give you a, a creator role, Shay Asad. That's your thread. That is your thread for real. Wait, like, oh my God. You're musky Elon. You're the thread. Well, there we go. I found your thread this morning. Well, not this morning, last night. And I thought about it. And I was like, I think this is a good idea to illustrate what we're talking about here. Okay. So please come through to the site and let us give you a, a fancy name because you definitely deserve it. And I would love to give you uh, some attention for you to talk about the stuff that you've gone through. We would love to have you on here. Just let me know once you come onto the site and we'll give you a fancy little name. Very happy to have you here. And uh, thank you for writing this thread. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, again, uh, yeah, um, what was I saying? Uh, I can't recall. Um, Thank you very much for Elemental. I appreciate that. Um, we need to get to a point, like I would love for us to get to a point in the world where we can act actually criticize these things without any of the taint of racism and prejudice. And I know that that's too much to ask for, but I think that we can at least get better at it, okay? I think that we can get better at it. And I, we, and, and we need to, okay? Because I know, by the way, that most of my audience is American. I know I have an international audience, which is the poggish shit in the world, and which is why I want to talk about international issues more and more, okay? <sighs> However, America is pro probably the biggest enabler of, the, of this genocide, okay? America is. Our politicians stand and back the very right-wing forces in Israel that are doing this, okay? And they often do it at the, at the same time as churning out horrific, horrific anti-Muslim sentiment. I can get a hold of a pro-Israel person from Israel if you want. Not sure they'd hop on stream, but it would give a counter narrative. He's a regular. No, I really don't think we need to have a, a pro-Israel perspective on this with all due respect. I wouldn't ask any other proponent or defender of this sort of thing for that. So no, I will be. But thank you. I appreciate that. But no, no genocide deniers. Not today. And so, anyway, what I was trying to say is that American lefties, okay, 
are in a very, very unique position where if we actually get good at, criti at critiquing this without dipping into any anti-Semitic tropes, we could actually make a change, okay? We could actually um, make a change in this. We have, we are in a unique position that we could apply pressure that might change this once and for all, okay? So this is something I want us to be very good at. And you'll also notice that I talk about anti-Semitism a lot. It's something that really bothers me. It's something I think that is a pervasive element and that we have not seen the end of um, global anti-Semitism. And this is why it's especially important for us to figure out how to fight anti-Semitism while also being able to condemn the actions of an apartheid state. Thank you very much, Sparkly Void. Really appreciate the tier one. Really, really appreciate the um, the tier one gifted sub from Q-Stick. Thank you both very much. Okay? And I want to I want to just point something else out, okay? Because in case anyone thinks that this is anywhere close to ending, Netanyahu yesterday uh, yesterday stated, we will continue the attack on Gaza with full force. Israel will intensify the air campaign against Gaza, and this is just the beginning, says Israeli Defense Minister Gantz. This is... This is unbelievable. It's almost unbelievable that it's happening. And yet here we are. Here we have another one from this story, from this morning. This was from just this morning, just a little bit ago, in fact. Hamas, we are ready for an escalation and ready for calm on the condition that they end the aggression against Jerusalem. Israeli authorities, Israel is not interested in ending the fighting until certain military goals are achieved. Okay? Ismail Hania. The head of Hamas's political bureau said in a speech on Tuesday night that the contacts were held in an attempt to calm the situation with a number of countries, among them both Qatar and Egypt. We clarified that the one who started this campaign of aggression is Israel and not us. They are the ones who murdered and hurt women and children, and Israel is responsible, Hania said. And he added, we are ready for an escalation, and we are ready for calm, on the condition that they end the aggression against Jerusalem. Egyptian mediators are working to mediate a ceasefire between Israel and the Gaza terror groups after nearly two days of escalating violence, says Channel 12 News. However, according to analysts at the outlet, Israel is not interested in ending the fighting until certain military goals are achieved. Do you know what that means, right? Do you know what it means when somebody says we have certain military goals? That means they either want to kill a certain amount of people, they want to kill a specific group of people, or they want to capture land. That's what military goals are. That's what, that's what the defensive war that's being waged is currently uh, the characteristic of that so-called defensive war. And, and, and that's just very, very fucked. And, and I had another, another little thing here that I wanted to bring up. However, I believe that I have lost track of it. Here we go. Ah, another one. I found it. Thank goodness. And this one, again, just so you know, this is coming from the horse's mouth. Okay? This is the official IDF, Israel Defense Force. Okay? The official Twitter. Verified and everything. To the citizens of Gaza, the IDF is striking Hamas weapons stores hidden inside of civilian buildings in Gaza. Although Hamas wants to put you in harm's way, we urge you to stay away from Hamas's weapon sites and get to safety. Our goal is only to strike terror. How, how much more blatant and obvious can you get than this? Our goal is only to strike terror.
The IDF is striking Hamas weapon stores hidden inside civilian weapons. I mean, civilian buildings. Imagine that. Imagine blowing up homes, blowing up apartment complexes with people in them. Hospitals. And then being like, we're doing this for your own good, uwu. Well, well, Gayfesh, if, if that's true, they should fix the tweet, Gayfesh. They should fix the tweet. This isn't translated. This isn't like an auto-translation, Gayfesh. They could delete this and fix this tweet, and they haven't. It's still up right now. It's still up right now. Oh, yes, they 100% intended to kill everyone in our home last night, says Shai Asad. I'm really sorry to hear that. That is horrifying. Of course, Benus. Benus says, is there an argument to be had that Israel's action in the region create the type of instability that anti-Semites will use to further their agenda? agenda? Doesn't this only make things worse? Yes, it does. Of course it does. This is why we stand against fascistic governments. And mind you, Israel's current government is a fascistic government. They are hyper-militarized. They are hyper-expansivist. They want to take over the land from a, a, a deeply impoverished and oppressed minority that they're currently closing in on. Like, and this has been going on for so long. If you look into the history of this, it gets even worse. It gets even bloodier. Do you know how just the deaths, the, the amount of deaths is ridiculous. And I want to point something out because this is an important uh, statement. Let me just close my window real quick here. There's another part of this that I want to talk about, okay? <sighs> okay? Which is generational trauma. Okay. Are you familiar? Is anybody familiar with the concept of generational trauma? Because generational trauma is a big part of this story. Okay. Generational trauma is when something so terrible happens that it affects multiple generations beyond the one that was, that was immediately affected. The Holocaust is one such example. Apartheid in South Africa, slavery, the Armenian genocide, the genocide going on in Palestine right now. These are all examples of things that have generational trauma. We will not see the end of the effects of this type of action for, for potentially a century. When your family is blown up, when your family is held at gunpoint, that will affect your kids. That will affect your grandchildren. If you lose, can you imagine how, I want to just, just give it, let me give an example of this, of one that you might not think of. Can you imagine what it would be like if your grandparents, through one reason or another, managed to get themselves a home that they owned, a home that was theirs, that they could pass down to their kids, that you would someday inherit, inherit one day. And one night, while your grandparents were there taking care of their home, they were evicted from that home, and it was taken from them, and you and your entire family became homeless overnight. Can you imagine how that would immediately change the entire trajectory of not just your grandparents' life, but your parents' life and your own life? That's the sort of thing that we're talking about, okay? We're talking about scars that do not heal easily. We are talking about trauma that leads to more bloodshed in the future. And the more haphazardly that blood is drawn, the more haphazardly that, 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 that belongings are stolen, that land is taken, that religions are stomped upon, that beliefs are attempted to be snuffed out, the longer that that goes on, the more likely that it will continue in the future. Because as it turns out, 
when somebody kills your family, it really isn't easy to let that go. It really is not. And I don't blame people for not being able to let that go. But you can't just kiss and make up after something like that happens. After you lose a friend to cruelty, after your brother gets beaten for illegally picking flowers on across the Israeli border. And it's something that isn't talked about particularly frequently, but it needs to be. Facts on facts. I had misdirected anger for so long, Shia said. Yes. Okay, there's a I'm 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 very happy. I'm I'm happy that I'm able to speak some truth to this because it's something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. I want to talk about something in America. And this might seem like a little bit of a funny parallel, but has anybody ever heard of the Hatfields and the McCoys? Anybody? Let's see. Let's do it. Let's do a quick uh quick poll. Here you go. No or don't know, okay? If you're in site chat, go ahead and vote on it, okay? All right, so some people know it, some people don't. Okay. There you go. Yeah, you just press the number. You just click on it. You can also type the number in chat. Yeah, I mentioned a Hatfield. I did, indeed. Yes, I did. It's silent. Okay, here we go. Cool. So... For those of you who don't know, I, I'm glad to know like 50% of the of people know about it. The Hatfields and McCoys were two very, very large families that were spread across uh, a section of, of Appalachia um, in, in America, okay? These were two big families. They had lots of children. They had lots of cousins and uncles and everything. And they had a feud that got bloody. They fought over land. They fought over politics. And it raged for generations i mean generations of people just in the woods rolling up with a shotgun that them one of their mccoy boys let's get him bam and all of a sudden you have a dead cousin because that cousin was a mccoy and the hatfields ran across him you would fight people would fight over cattle people would fight over woods i mean i'm talking about generations of people killing each other and fucking each other over because well, my cousin was killed by the McCoys. Well, my cousin was killed by the Hatfields. And they went at it. And it was blood and blood and blood until there was just nobody left. Until nobody could even remember why they were fighting anymore. Just so much blood. So many innocent people killed. So much, so much agony and frustration. And there, this is an example of generational trauma. It is the example, it is an example of a struggle that can go on so long that nobody even remembers what originally started it, but everyone has pain from it. Just people who, because of violence, become inevitably stuck together, harming each other for as long as you can possibly imagine. That's an actual real story. The Hatfields versus the McCoys was a real thing. Yeah. Tell me what we're fighting for. I don't remember anymore. Yep. The Hatfields and McCoys, by the way, was like a, it was like a, a like a chunk of America, like Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, multiple states. This 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 conflict raged over for for generations. Yeah, it started in the Civil War and it kept going for 28 years. And by the way, 28 years of fighting is multiple generations of people involved in that fight. 30 years of bloodshed. Holy shit. Can you imagine? Has anybody, like, I don't even know how to make, yeah, shit, it's two families, but the families are extended families. No, 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 no. It's like tribal size. Yeah, not like an American nuclear family. Hatfields and McCoys was extended relatives. Like, it was like two, it was like, a mafia war unironically it was like a, 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 a an american appalachian um uh gang war 
imagine you going to fight a war your great grandparents fought in. Yep. Yep. And we're talking, and by the way, that's small scale compared to what we're talking about right now. What we're talking about in Gaza is, is so many ma magnitudes larger that you can't even think about it. If you can think about I want you to just like put yourself in the position of the Hatfields and the McCoys, where if you're living in a town, there's a chance that somebody rolls up and shotguns you in the back of the head, blows your arm off, shoots your little sister, shoots your little brother, decapitates your dad, but magnify that over thousands of families, over decades upon decades. And now you have an idea of the magnitude of trauma that is unfolding from this ongoing ethnic cleansing and genocide in Israel. And this is why it is so goddamn important for us to get a grasp on this issue and to take it seriously. Because if we don't, we are spitting in the face of the history of the world. It's not hard for us to look at the Holocaust and go, oh my God, what a, what a horrific disaster. Shia said, I'm going to go make smoke a bowl and try to sleep. Good night, friends. Thank you for your support, Demon Mama. I will be back. I'm going to record a podcast episode tomorrow. So much love to you all for being here, listening and speaking up. Palestinians are so strong, but we are also so tired. Much love to you, Shia said. Please, if you're willing uh, and if you think of it, DM me the episode. I would love to listen to it, okay? If you DM that to me on Discord um, you can, or on Twitter, either one, I'm going to shoot you a follow on Twitter right now. So... Uh, you'll see my account and uh, you can DM me on Twitter and I'll, I'll take a listen to it. We might even, we might even, we could probably listen to it on stream depending on the length. So get some rest. You deserve it. And thank you very much for coming by. Um, but what I was going to say was, um, yeah, we, when we talk about the Holocaust and I've talked about this before. I've talked about my particular stake that I have in the Holocaust, right? Because one of the first people targeted at the beginning of the Holocaust were trans people, were queer people. One of the first victims of the Nazi regime was this Institute for Sexual Studies run by Magnus Hirschfeld. And we lost almost a century of science on gay people, trans people, Intersex people, just gone in the blink of an eye. Decades of work, of research, of people pouring their blood and sweat into better understanding the world from a compassionate perspective, of improving people's lives and freeing them from suffering, and just ash. Like the fucking ash of my cigarette, gone in the blink of an eye. Set us back. We could have been... For all, right now, who knows? By this time, who knows what type of technology we would have for trans people right now? Disabled people, yeah. I really wish I could do something to help them, but what the fuck do we do to help stop this? Take a position. Take a position and learn your position well. Learn how to defend your position. Learn how to do that, to, to defend that position without and without leaning on tropes. Learn how to write a convincing letter to a representative. Watch out for representatives that are not anti-Semitic, but are willing to take a stance in the defense of Palestine. Those are the ways that you can start to get involved. You can donate to charities that do a good job of actually materially helping Palestinian people. And you can voice your support when you have the option. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it for that $5 super chat. Thank you so much. Yeah, Bernie's a good one. Yep. Criticize Israel without mercy, but do not tolerate criticism of the Jewish people. That is correct. Taking it, you'd be surprised what, what taking a, a, um, uh, you'd be surprised what taking a position can actually do to change 
the, the, the state of culture, okay? You, you notice something, this is something that I think gets um, talked about le like uh, not, not frequently enough, okay? Which is that cultural changes, making up your mind on a position and standing by your beliefs on that position can actually shift the direction of culture especially if you advocate that position to others. And all of a sudden, there is ideas disseminating out through culture that changes the way that we look at things as a society. That is very powerful. And I am only one voice. I am one voice who connects to many. My power is in that I can teach you, I can give you the seeds of knowledge that you need to start building your own position so that you can affect other people. And then it has a multiplicative exponential effect. I mean, that's why you watch me after all, right? You watch me because you are interested in politics and you want to make a difference in the world. And that's how you do it. You take what you learn here, you digest it, you improve it with your own knowledge, and then you go out into the world and you change that world. That is what this channel is all about. And also, recognize that far-right groups all over the world have similar intent and similar tactics. You look at what right-wing groups, right-wing hyper-nationalist, hyper-Zionist groups are doing in Israel right now, and you will see direct parallels to what right-wing news groups like Newsmax and Fox News are doing here. Aren't American Jews generally pro-Palestine? It's fucknut evangelicals who are Zionists. Yes, and that is a very weird thing. I could talk about that another time. My dad was one of those people. My dad was an evangelical who went on one of those um, on one of those Israel tour things that are designed for evangelicals because evangelicals believe that that uh, the current state of Israel will be highly, highly referent, uh, uh, important for the end times. It's very fucked. It's really, really fucked. Yeah, it's a rap. It's it's connected to rapture stuff. It's very complicated, but yes, it is bullshit. Okay. All right. Okay. And that's the segment. Okay. That's what I have to tell you. Okay. That's, that's what I have to, had to tell you. Okay. We talked about it. That is the heaviest topic we're going to be talking about today. Okay. Um, and I think it's important and I'm sure we're going to be talking about it again in the future. I know we will, because it's not looking like this is going to stop anytime soon, but I figured that I would give everybody a bit of a catch up on this situation and give my position and what I believe we should do as lefties to be more effective at actually having a chance at stopping this. How can you respond to the argument that the death of civilians is used to Hamas using them as human shields? Here's an easy one. Why would Israel need to blast through human shields if they can defend themselves? Why would Israel uh, uh, need to punish collectively those civilians who are, vic who are supposedly victims if their actual goal was to harm the terrorists? Why would they need to, uh, to uh, enforce a disgusting police state? an essentially an open air prison why would they need to uh support d deeper and deeper colonization of palestinian land if it was just about human shields it's not just about human shields is it that's how you can approach something like that that's one way that you can do it because what their approach is not what you would do if somebody was using someone as a human shield you would negotiate. You would hear out those demands and you would say, okay, well, can we alleviate this in any way? Keep in mind, Israel is in a, po in a position of great power. They are not the weak ones here. They are in a position of incredible power. They have a leg up in technology. They have a leg up in funding. They have the backing of America, the biggest imperial country on the planet. And they surround the Palestinians on all sides. So what do you mean using them as shields? They are in the position of power. 
And additionally, Cook, as Cookies points out, you can use that argument to justify anything, can't you? It's not a very good argument. Hasn't Israel been known to use civilians as human shields themselves? Every country does that. If Here's a secret. Every state uses civilians as human shields. Every last state. They all do it. It's horrible. This is why we criticize states. Because states will claim to themselves as representatives of all the people, even if all the people don't agree with them. And we like to pretend that we're past that, but that ain't true. That ain't true. From my understanding, neither wants negotiation. They both feel like they are the rightful owners of the land. Wrong. You're incorrect, Reindia. If you look into the past actions of Hamas, in addition, in addition to the public statements by Hamas, Hamas has repeatedly stated that they are willing to negotiate, but Israel is not. We literally just looked at this. Here, I can, we just looked at this. Let me give you an example of this. Are you ready? Here we go. Here's one example. Netanyahu, we will continue the attack on Gaza with full force. Israel will intensify the air campaign, and this is just the beginning, says Israeli Defense Minister Gantz. And here we go. We got another one right down here. I just grabbed this one. Where, where did it go? Hold on. Oh, yeah. This was the other one that I wanted to talk about, but we already talked about it, so I can just bring this up. I'll just bring up this one. Uh, let me get you this. Where did it go? Hey, where'd my post go? God damn it. Ah, here it is. Here you go. To the citizens of Gaza. This is the official Israeli Defense Force account. To the citizens of Gaza. The IDF is striking Hamas weapon stores hidden inside civilian buildings in Gaza. Although Ham Hamas wants to put you in harm's way, we urge you to stay away from Hamas's weapon sites and get to safety. Our only goal is to strike terror. And we have yet another example. And this is all just for now. This is not to talk about the past. This is not to talk about the past. Here we go. Here's a quote directly from Hamas, the Hamas leader, Ismail Haneye, the, lead, the head of Hamas's political bureau, said in a speech on Tuesday that they clarified that the one who started this particular campaign of aggression is Israel, not us. We are ready for an escalation, and we are also ready for calm on the condition that they end aggression against Jerusalem. So it's simply not true that the Palestinians and that even Hamas is open to negotiation. Israel does have a lot to gain. And in fact, if you look at the history of Netanyahu, Netanyahu ha knows that he has a lot to gain and he wants to gain it. Netanyahu has not made, has, has made it very clear that his goal is to get it all. He just needs excuses to justify it so that he can maintain power internally. Because as it turns out, there's still a sizable chunk of people in his own country that really don't think that genocide is a good thing. Didn't Trump exasperate this by cozying up to Netanyahu? Yes, he did. Netanyahu and Trump were like this. Oh, fuck. I dropped my straw. Yuck. It's okay. It landed on my shirt and not on the floor. And moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Yes. Which was, um, and, uh, which was intending to, yeah. Trump loves authoritarians. And if there's an authoritarian we can point to right now, it is definitely Netanyahu. Do the people of Israel generally agree with Netanyahu? Well, that's complicated, right? Because keep in mind that uh, a lot of the people who disagree with Netanyahu are conveniently not able to have a democratic say. He keeps getting elected, but people can't, the people who oppose him don't have, don't get citizenship. Yeah. They're, like, voter suppression, anti-democratic measures are a huge problem there, just like they are here.